friends, today is Christ the King Sunday. It is the last Sunday of our liturgical year. As I indicated earlier, tomorrow, not, next Sunday rather, is our first Sunday of Advent. The start of a new year and a season of anticipation as we wait in joyful hope to celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so today's passages remind us of the sovereignty and power of Christ. Our lectionary passage for this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, the 25th chapter, verses 31 to 46. Listen to God's word. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his throne in glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. When I was naked, you gave me clothing. When I was sick, you took care of me. When I was in prison, you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For when I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do, to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you draw near to us. Although we praise you on your throne in heaven. We are reminded that you in Christ are God with us, with us now, with us always. And so we pray that your presence will be made known. May the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A few years ago, there was a contemporary parable that played out on social media. It was the story of a pastor who was newly or, uh, called to serve a large congregation. Well, on the first day of his ministry, he arrived to worship outside, disguised as someone who was homeless. He sat on the steps of the church and greeted folks who were entering the building, excited to meet their new pastor and worship God together. Not long after the last congregant was seated, this pastor walked down the center aisle and introduced himself from the pulpit, still in his disguise, letting the congregation know that he was, in fact, not someone who was homeless, but he was their new pastor and would be calling them to serve God in spirit and in truth, in word and in deed, and hoping that together they would open their eyes and their hearts to the needs of those around them. Well, upon further investigations, Snopes, um, the fact-checking website on the internet, called that story a fabrication. 
But to my surprise, Snopes noted several occasions when something similar actually happened in real life. In one instance, the pastor's daughter-in-law and daughter cut the pastor's hair and trimmed his beard while he was preaching from the pulpit in ragtag clothes and unkempt after he had lived for a week on the streets. In fact, the premise for this type of social and psychological and spiritual experiment originated as a psychology experiment at Princeton University in which psychology students put seminary students to the test. Seminary students were sent out into the world to complete an urgent assignment, yet on their way to complete the task, they encountered an actor who portrayed a person in distress with great need. Psychology students were nearby to note and examine if and how these seminary students stopped to help the one who was in distress, exploring this ram these ramifications for life and ministry together. Now, I don't know about you, but tests of this nature make me shudder a little bit. Is there someone who's tracking my actions and my inactions? I can't help but go back through my memory to do the same type of fact-checking on myself and on my own behaviors. See, I want to live as a person of integrity and of faith. I want to trust that my choices are going to place me in the company of sheep. Yet, if I were to be fully transparent, I am haunted by my inner goat. See, every time I think I've gotten it right, that I have fed the hungry or welcomed the outcast, I am reminded of a time when I have lived my best goat life, a time when I failed to do the same. As Thanksgiving Day approaches, I am reminded of Thanksgiving of 1999. My husband and I were living in Chennai in India and decided to celebrate Thanksgiving by providing food for a family who lived on the street outside of a restaurant where we frequently ate our meals. Three generations of this family lived on woven plastic mats with a small cook stove and all of their possessions gathered in baskets and bags around them. Now, we would often visit with this family sitting there and talking following a meal, my husband would do magic tricks or juggle to entertain the children, and the grandma would often paint my hands with henna. Now, on this particular Thanksgiving day, there was, no, there was a rickshaw strike, and so there was no transportation nearby that would allow my husband and I to go to the shop where we had planned to purchase huge bags of rice and lentils. So we set off on foot. Soon, a man approached us, noting that we were foreigners, and began to tell us the story of his exile from his home country of Sri Lanka. He told us of the violence and oppression that he and his family had endured because of their Tamil ethnicity. We gave him some money, and we listened to his story with compassion. Yet as we were seeking to give him our undivided attention, another man approached from the side. He got too close. He started begging, holding out his hand and saying, ma, 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 seeking to get my attention. I ignored him. Couldn't he see that he was interrupting an important conversation? Couldn't he just wait his turn? Now he persisted to ask for help and to interrupt this conversation with this other needy stranger. And I was firm in my ability to ignore him. I confess, at that time, I was a little bit proud of my resolve. Eventually, he got up and moved away. And it was only after he had gotten far enough away for me to see the entirety of his being without shifting my gaze that I noticed that he was a man who had been afflicted by leprosy. His hand and his foot had deteriorated. He used a cane to walk. His head was bandaged. He was truly the least of these, the most outcast of the outcast, those most sick, most unable to work. He was truly reliant on the compassion of strangers for his next meal 
and I was crushed. Just when I thought I was being a sheep, I was being a goat. See, when we hear this passage this morning, it's hard for us not to do the math. It's hard for us to not step into the story and try to figure out where we might fall. Sometimes this passage might make us wish that there was, in fact, a universal naughty and nice list, and that with an internet search, we could quickly find where we might land and the action steps to make sure that our place as a sheep is embedded. We want to be counted a sheep. We want to be assured that we will land in the kingdom of God. We want to be patted on the back by God and told, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now, candidly, there is something to be said for this approach. Being convicted of our bad choices challenges us to do better. Cultivating a desire to belong as one of God's people can encourage us to seek out the ways where we might truly put that sense of belonging into action in community to form our world together, our life together, to reflect God's holiness. And as a mom of a three-year-old who is trying to make sure my child does not run out into traffic, a little dose of fear can be a compelling corrective. So a little fear of damnation might help us set our sights on the prize and veer our actions toward eternal reward. <clears throat> but frankly, friends, there are challenges if we stick with this approach of interpretation. See, if we focus on trying to establish our place among the sheep, in many ways, this approach supports the narcissism that this passage is trying to warn against. It places us at the center of the story. It emphasizes our own ability to focus on ourselves, to pick ourselves up from our bootstraps, <clears throat> to be saved by virtue of our own actions, our own choices, our worth, our identity as a sheep or a goat. It makes the story about us. And while good deeds and works of charity are essential to the life of faith, Centering ourselves in the story starts to tip the scales towards a model of works righteousness that Reformed theologians have warned against for centuries. See, we worship a God who has saved us by grace through faith. It is only by the grace of God poured out for us in the love of Christ Jesus that we have earned any eternal reward. <laughs> There is nothing we can do to assure our place in God's kingdom. There are not enough good deeds we could do to be counted as sheep. Now what's more, what's kind of interesting is that there are so many commentators who even suggest that this passage isn't about us at all. There are those who argue that this passage is an invitation, an open door in which God recognizes the righteous living of those who fall outside of the family of faith, those who believe in other gods, those who do not recognize Jesus as Messiah. They argue that, in fact, when Jesus is, that Jesus is, in fact, recognized in the least and the lowly. And that this is a passage of welcome in which God claims those outside of the church as sheep, saved by God's love. So what does this passage say to us? It is an important passage in our gospel. It marks the end of our liturgical year. And in fact, it is a gospel passage that has led us as a congregation and as a denomination to be identified as a Matthew 25 congregation. So what does this passage mean to us? What do we do? Well, today I would like to focus not on whether we fall in this story as sheep or goats. I would like to call our attention to the word that 
opens this passage, the word when. We hear this when throughout the passage. When the Son of Man comes in all his glory. When the Son of Man is surrounded by angels. When Christ is met or when Christ is not met in the least of his disciples. When. This is a word that seems to be a bit elusive in our current context. <coughs> Sentences of certainty like, oh, when I go to my mom's house for Thanksgiving dinner, I will get to eat her famous pumpkin pie in the softest chair at her dining table, have been replaced with more aspirational sentences like, when there's a vaccine that is safe and effective and available to everyone, I will be able to eat my mom's apple pie or pumpkin pie in her house with her again. There is no date attached, just a hoped for future. When has come to mark a time for which we are waiting? When we can go all the way close to one another again? When the schools will be open? When we won't have to wear masks? But right now we live in an if world. If the numbers are down, maybe daycare will open again. If the weather is nice, maybe we can meet outside for a brief visit with our masks at a safe distance and see another person in the flesh who does not live in our own household. But if the weather is bad, we can do a drive-by parade for a birthday or a holiday, and we can wave through the glass that separates us and keep us safe. And so we mark our days with plans A through F, contingency upon contingency, trying to figure out how to navigate the ifs that mark our days. We wait for rulings on the day-to-day -day conditions of our lives, which seem to be ever-changing. And this is not only relegated to the context of a global pandemic. The same can be said when we think about um, the state of our election and the state of our nation as we await the certification of the results of the number, November 3rd election. There is so much that seems unsettled in our world. Our ability to adapt and adapt again and adapt again is being stretched. Anxiety is up, energy is down. We need something to hold on to. And scripture gives us when. When we focus on this word, we see that our focus is directed to Jesus, the one who is our shepherd and who is our rock and who is our redeemer and who is our savior and who is our teacher and who is our friend. The when in this passage is Christ. In a sea of uncertainty and struggle and doubt, Christ is in our midst. Not just an enthroned sovereign surrounded by angels, but today, here and now, located right in the midst of human frailty and vulnerability and suffering and need. The when introduced to us by Matthew is not just a hoped for time, but now. Today, Christ is with us. Among the hungry and the naked and the imprisoned and the ill, Christ is here in the world today, hidden in plain sight, even within us. In our imperfection and in our doubt and our worry and in our fear and in our coughs and our sneezes and our separation and our anxiety and our wounds and in our messiest version of the holidays we're trying to so beautifully engage in. In the midst of all that is confusing, Christ is here. When? Now. We might not recognize Jesus among us. We might not recognize Christ within us. But God is true to God's promises to be with us right now. And so Matthew extends an invitation to us that in a world bent on categorizing along lines of affiliations or associations that we see so clearly in this passage 
what we have been shown throughout all of the Gospels, and that is that Jesus identifies with the marginalized, with those who are hungry and naked and outcast and ill and imprisoned. And in searching for Christ, we then see those with whom Christ aligns. Our love for Christ attunes our hearts to love those Christ loves too. Friends, when we want to see Christ, we must look among those who have been told that they do not count. When we want to work with Christ, we need to prize what he values. When we want to encounter Christ, all that we have to do is shift our focus and spy Christ among those who are told that they don't matter and that maybe they never will. Among children in cages along the southern border of our nation, among black men and women and boys and girls who are gunned down with no warning, who too seldom receive any justice, among those battling addictions and afflictions, those who are barred from belonging because of their gender, their sexual identity, their ability, their ethnicity, their religion, or anything else that marks them, them. When we want to encounter Jesus, we need to look with eyes of love, shedding any pretense of elitism, and recognize that God is with all of God's people, especially those on the margins. See, the beauty of this passage is that it assures us of our unity with Christ. When we stop focusing on ourselves and look outward, shifting from the promotion of our own wants and focus on the needs of another, that when we shift from our own upward advancement and notice our own vulnerability and humility, when we shift from our own individual desire to be set apart and rather prize communion with others, especially those who are ignored or not like us or who make us uncomfortable. It is here that we will see God. When? Now. See, friends, we can see Christ. We can claim this emphasis as individuals and as a congregation and focus our eyes to find Christ because he is in our midst. And as we end this liturgical year, we are reminded that when is now. That yes, Christ is here among us in our fears and our wounds and our limits. Christ is here among those whose hand we cannot hold, among those for whom we cannot serve food without wearing masks. Christ is here with those who we cannot visit because we need to maintain an appropriate, safe social distance. But Christ is here now calling us to love as Christ loved us. See, it is this love, this love that is present in the least and the lost and the lonely. It is this love that is power. It is this love that makes change in our world. It is this love that gives life, new life, abundant life for all God's people everywhere. Friends, may we give thanks that this is the God that we worship and serve. A God whose love for us is so strong and powerful that that same God put on flesh and dwelt among us. Taking on our vulnerability, taking on our suffering, taking on our uncertainty and our pain, taking on our questions and our cries, taking on our sin taking on all within us that might relegate us to classification as a goat. 
Let us give thanks that God is with us and has claimed us as God's own. And may we go out and see Christ in others. Let this be our challenge and our charge. Let this be the way that we live out Christ's love. May it be so. Amen.